What's up? Welcome to the Confluence VC podcast. This podcast is meant to give you a personal glimpse into the next era of investors and operators. This week we had on Faye with Unshackled Ventures. Unshackled is an early stage fund focused on partnering with and supporting immigrant founded startups. The fund invests agnostically across verticals and Faye spends most of her time within AR, VR, Gen Z and internet culture. Outside of work, she also co-authors a weekly newsletter called High Tea that dives into the topic she's interested in. In this episode, we discuss the explosion of the creator economy and the secondary effects of this transition, the art of curation and audience building, why AR and VR is poised to get over the adoption issue, and evaluating timing risk as an investor. Everybody, welcome to the Confluence VC podcast. Today, we have someone who works at a firm that is near and dear to my heart and incredibly relevant to the times that are occurring in our country and abroad. We have Faye from Unshackled, uh, a company or firm that I actually worked for and wrote my senior thesis in college for. And uh, we've heard from numerous people about just how dope she is in the consumer space. Now, she's going to be one of the greatest minds that, that we've seen in the space. And uh, just outside of that, the, from the, the folks on her team, from Maria to Tanine and everyone else, I'm just really happy to have you here. So in two minutes or less, you want to give us a brief overview of, of how you got an adventure and your role today? Sure. Thanks for that intro. That's awesome. So I had a, a somewhat unconventional route into venture. I feel like just as Unshackled has this thesis to invest in, in immigrant founders, they have the same thesis to invest in immigrant investors. So I was, I'm a Brit and I was a young and hungry operator at a startup. I'd been working in the fashion industry in Milan and London during university and then moved to Barcelona and there worked with an ex Silicon Valley executive. From there, met my partner actually, moved to Vancouver, got extremely fanatic about marketing, specifically VR and AR which at the time and still to some extent today wasn't marketed very well. It's very hard to present like an immersive experience through a, a 2D ad. Uh, and it was a hassle. This was back in like 2017, 2018 to get heads in the hardware and the headsets. So loved that challenge, became a CMO at Facemoji. So we created avatars for Gen Z and I grew that community and helped on the product side. So we grew that to, to 4 million downloads when I left. And I was just fascinated about building immersive experiences for consumer and how Gen Z and Alphas were using the app. And from there, we went out to raise our seed and I just started learning way more about the venture scene. And when we were in this meeting with Sequoia, and I, I just realized that this was where I wanted to be. And actually Sequoia had just funded Little Michaela months prior, so this was in 2018. And I just realized, yes, this is, I, I need to be funding these sorts of uh, cool, crazy experiences and really bring more art back into the tech world. And so then I applied for Unshackled and I guess the rest is history. We invest, as you said, in, in immigrant founders. So we invest pre-seed, pre-product, pre-revenue. And yeah, really excited to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You all are an amazing team. Not many people know this, but when Donald Trump first came into office, I, had, I wrote like an 80 page thesis. <laughs> Uh, on why it made no sense for him to stop immigrants from coming into our country because of the impact that they were having on, on Silicon Valley tech markets, et cetera, and just like how positive they were for innovation in our country. And uh, I actually gave and co-wrote that paper as a fellow at Unshackled under Maria Nitin and Manan to help launch the fun, was it fun two at the time? Man, time for yeah, <laughs> And I was just so excited to learn about how they were seeing these things. They helped inform uh, how I would even approach that topic. So big congrats to Donald Trump being out of office and for our uh, government not experiencing a coup. <laughs> and big congrats <laughs> on you for joining an amazing team who was, who was ahead of the curve on this. And in addition to that, just has an incredible investment thesis, right? Like the fact that you invest in, in immigrant entrepreneurs and like 30 to 40% of uh, founder teams, depending on how you look, how you cut it have some type of immigrant founder on that team, at least in the first few hires, like you are in really good shape to, to have an advantage ac across a myriad of different opportunities to beat out the best funds and it's shown in your return. So. hundred percent, hundred percent. And we really see that as our advantage, but at the same point on the same token, 
we think these immigrants would succeed with or without us. We're just really just trying to make the process a lot smoother <laughs> and give them the same opportunity. That's all we're really trying to do. They're the experts. We're just the ones that are funding and being those supporters on the sidelines. What's so funny is like, they will succeed either way. That's what all the exactly. difference is. That's why I love you all's fun. And, and yeah, you all exactly. also add a ton of valuable tools to make it easier for them to get employees, to set themselves up here and a ton, a ton of other stuff. All immigrant founders, please call pay <laughs> and the Unshackled team, their family and great people. Yeah, um, and this is whether you're just starting out, you've got your idea, uh, you've done some initial customer discovery, we definitely want to hear from you. It's never too early for us. Now that, I've, now that we've taken some time to like, endlessly plug them and do a promotion love me like for that. that. Let's, let's dive into the weeds. Like we were saying, everyone says that you're like a really great consumer investor. That being said, we would love to just get an understanding of where your passion for consumer came from. And then mm -hmm. from there, dive into a few trends that you see in the space. Sure. That's so awesome to hear. Thank you. I guess to be completely honest, it all goes back to my childhood when I spent a ton of my time in simulation games. So I was all about <laughs> Rollercoaster Tycoon. Yeah, really. And Sims. I was an only child. It meant a lot of days just holed up in my mom's dental office in between like the instruments um, building my worlds. And I was on this rickety yacht top and people would be coming and going all the time. And I would just be so engrossed. It was my thing. And I know that Z's are still doing this now because I subscribe to all their streams, but I don't unfortunately have time to uh, play anymore. But I think this was like what really fueled my passion for consumer. It's and what I feel is also sets maybe just what I do apart. And we'll talk a little bit more about high tea is I really try to hop into these worlds. It's not enough just to talk about these platforms. It's not enough just to have an outsider's perspective. I really feel that you have to go in and experience them be amongst Gen Z in the environment and hear about, hear what they're talking about as well. The best customer discovery you can ultimately do is hopping into Roblox. And this was ultimately what led myself and my best pal, Alice, um, who's probably listening now, hi, to start <laughs> IT. I was talking about all these platforms uh, and apps and she was all about YouTube and influencers. So we actually met at high school and later we bonded over our love for TikTok back in sort of 2018, 2019. And since then we, we started High Tea, which covers everything from Gen Z consumer culture, from Bernie memes to virtual concerts. Yeah, we started High Tea just for our love and our long Telegram chats, which we mm. thought, oh my God, this just has to be a, a sub stack. We did that. <laughs> The players told me a ton about high tea and I haven't been able to dive into it yet, but I'm going to subscribe today. I'm really, really oh, I love that. We love yeah. that. Yeah, no, we, it's really a labor of love. It's something that I wake up really early on a Sunday to write my time and it's late her time. She's in England, obviously, and I'm in Vancouver. So yeah, it's really not kept our friendship going, but my God, <laughs> it's been amazing. It's been amazing just to have to wake up and work on something, a side hustle with a best pal. Yeah, it's honestly, if anyone's thinking about doing it, I starting a sub stack, I also really recommend doing it with a, a good friend as well. It really keeps it going. And we've been doing it now for over a year. So um, testament to that. Agree, agree. Well, <laughs> I mean, with that, let's dig into some of the stuff that you might put into there or oh, the that you might yes. put into the world in terms of consumer trends. What are, what oh, are the things that you're saying? What's hot? <laughs> the infrastructure to invest behind. Like, let's hold yeah. in, please. Okay, okay. I love this question. And I'm always trying to hop into these platforms and find the next thing. So, Whoa, um, caveat. quick caveat. Someone asked me, like, first off, like, I'll do some consumer stuff at Greypoint, but like, my key focus is like enterprise, fintech, healthcare, and some other stuff. <laughs> but someone just asked me to comment on my uh, thoughts on consumer trends. I'm totally by the <laughs> yeah. So actually, I have to caveat this with saying that actually Unshackled is agnostic. So we invest across the board. But what I'm going to talk about now is purely what I love to invest in on the consumer side. But yes, all <laughs> founders out there. I have to say that I'm really excited about. So a couple of things. So chatbots is AI companions. So using the smarts of AI and NLP. So in the pandemic, apps such as Replica have been doing really well to engage Gen Z and be their sort of avatar support system. And of course, with the machine learning, the, it gets, the chatbot gets smarter as you interact with it. One thing that I, I noticed about Replica, especially in the pandemic as well, is lots of Zs, sorry, Gen Zs are referring to it as a game over an app. 
And I think this is something that's really exciting. You can see that in the reviews. Same when I worked at Facemoji, no one referred to Facemoji as an app, which is what we would tend to probably call it because it was just more just taking filters and overlaying on the face. We were a game to the Gen Z. So it's very interesting how they talk even about chatbots as, as games. So I'm very interested in that uh, language around chatbots. Virtual fashion, so the fashion industry, obviously I came from it, so very interested in this. It has really felt a shakeup this year. I couldn't believe how much progress has been made. It's honestly astounding. We saw Zoom catwalks, never thought we'd see the day. Virtual <laughs> trials, the explosion of custom in-game assets. Everyone wants to create their own clothes. People it is crazy create- how much people spend on there. It's thousands of dollars. I swear to you, my little brother spent thousands of dollars on yes. in-game purchases. Yes. The margins are crazy. That. Scalability crazy. <laughs> I know. And I, I love that. So I saw that and I agree. And I have been also trying to learn some of like these 3D design tools like Marvelous Designer and Clo, because I also see like the big, the really big opportunity here is like being able to design. The problem is with these tools right now is that they're still pretty high level. It's, we need like the Canva version for this really Mm. to go mainstream. But yeah, I completely agree with you. Like the Gen Z consumer, they've, they've grown up at this intersection of fashion and gaming. There are these two worlds that have been perceived as really far but apart, but really it's now mainstream culture. And you said it yourself, they're spending so much money on these skins. It's predicted to reach like 50 billion or something like that. And by the end of 2022, <laughs> and then you see companies like Tribute and the Fabricant who have been built like in, in Europe and that are building out these solutions for the new consumer. So we live online now, right? The, the confines of the real world no longer exist. So let's go wild. I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm, sorry, but I'm just thinking like with that, it seems like it's becoming easier and easier. Like all the barriers to entry are disappearing. Yeah. One, creating these solutions in, in these platforms and two, for creating content. And I'm curious as to where you see this headed, mm-hmm. where you see the, what you see is like the secondary and tertiary effects of the shifts. And then where you see the actual largest uh, opportunities, one for investment and two for uh, creators. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of, on the fashion side, I don't think we've got to that flywheel growth yet. So I'm still betting on these 3D tools coming up and us really getting to that point when we have so much content that creators are on Roblox, for example, the creator program is still gated. I wouldn't be surprised if David Bazuki is getting bombarded with requests right now because creators are making six figs just on small virtual assets, USD. So I think there, I think that's still untapped, but in terms of, that's a really important point actually about like the secondary effects. And I think Gabby wrote a really good article on this, Gabby Goldberg, on Love like Gabby. the power of, yeah, same. Haven't spoken to her yet. That's, that's was she, I, I believe she was one of the people who recommended you. <laughs> Love that. So yeah, I really have to chat to her now. But like the, she talks about like curatorship as the new creator. And I, I love that idea because it's very in vogue. Thinking about something like Substack, for example, loads of people are, ta- and there's a new Substack every day, it feels. Everyone is ta- like synthesizing the data they see online. And I think like those that have an expert level of curation are the ones that are going to ultimately succeed. And I have to preface this with, I don't think curation is just like a combination of links. I think it's like actually augmenting that content. So it's like a superhuman layer on top. And this is what we try to do at High Tea, like with our unique voice, style, like we're two Brits. We write how we talk as if we were right back in the sick form, common room. And this method is also something with TikTok, like the medium is the message, the audio is shared, and then it's augmented by other videos and it becomes a meme. So we're collaborating and curating like never before on the internet. And I'm excited about it because it just means the cream of the crop is going to come to the top. And I think those that are really making individual campaign or individual content are going to really be rewarded. I love it. So I I think that's all spot on. Do you have any insights into the the means in which you've seen people grow really great uh, communities and the Mm. tools that they can use to do that? Because what we've seen is that because there is such a large influx of content creators, Mm -hmm. like there is an increasingly competitive landscape. Like I've seen like my favorite YouTuber, his name is Kevin Edwards Jr. Go from like struggling to being incredibly wealthy, like where he has Lamborghinis and G-Wagons and bought an estate and all this random stuff, right? 
uh, mm -hmm. off of Roblox, ironically. And uh, I'm just wondering, like, how will that persist? And like, how are these new, like new kids on the block effectively going to just eat their market share away? And, like, what tools are they going to be using? Yeah, I think it's worth noting that like big time creators were heavily reliant on SponCon, which suffered greatly during YouTube's apocalypse. So I think we've seen this like pivot in years of, in the last years of people really, of these creators really capitalizing on their moment, whether that's merch david dobrik has a couple more businesses we actually invested in dispo so unshackled obviously he's an immigrant so we love that so i really love that because it gives power and and control back to the creator and it really allows those that are coming up with new ideas and willing to push the boundaries like mr beast and actually creating content that people are, are choosing to watch over others it's all about getting gaining headspace and, and mind share uh, at this point and I love the idea of us and, and creators just moving on and finding their own paths and gives power back to the creator. Interestingly, they are becoming their own creation studios and, and that's something we can chat about later as well. But I'm really excited about actually those like the deplatforming and these creators actually being able to start their own lines and actually engage with fans more so than they've ever been able to before and actually see the dollars after it. Yeah. Forget SponCon. I've yeah. actually, I just was talking to a really interesting influencer. Ironically, he's my cousin. His name is Key Influencer. He has 400,000 uh, followers on Club. Nice. But which, which you could imagine what his other followers look like. <laughs> and he's like, the next step is for everyone to use these platforms to take followers off of them. Mm -hmm. And um, using things like Mighty and Honeycomb or Discord or whatever they might use to make these private communities or closed rooms even on Clubhouse. And I, th I think you're 100% right. Owning the moment and then owning the audience itself once you reach that critical mass yeah and, and oh, go sorry ahead. go ahead no you got it this is your talk <laughs> so I, I like that idea though as well it's about building community around around your content as well so you mentioned like the discord channels i love that stuff and gen z loves that stuff we have moderators there for a reason it's a a lot of the times these creators have these amazing communities that when they're supporting them monetarily even in covid which is really interesting in itself. Like Patreon is taking off. And I think there's something very interesting about like the relation between the fan and the creator during uh, this time. It's increased and it's like the support, everything is more authentic. There's less distance between us and the creator. And something like when I grew up with my celebrities, that was, it was really impossible to imagine, but now it's very real and these people are human and I really love that move. And it's very interesting that it's happening even during a global pandemic. Agreed hundred percent. So speaking of pandemics, uh, a sleeper technology category that will, oh, wow. that has been accelerated a bit during COVID. You can tell me if you have more data to me that it's accelerated a lot is like the AR VR space. How exactly do you see the continuing slow but sure adoption of the tech and how does that impact consumer, consumer investing just generally? And yeah. if you think it's going to die, let us know. <laughs> now, this is an interesting point because we still don't know how many Quest 2s were sold this year. But what we do know is that it was a whole heap judging by their position on the App Store. And in fact, in the Q4 report, the Oculus Quest 2 it more than doubled Facebook's Q4 non-revenue data. It was 885 million up from three, four, six million in Q4 2019. So that's an increase of 156% year over year. So I think we're really turning a corner on this hardware. I love it. I still think it's really hard to market it. Oculus are definitely doing a better job, but where we're really seeing wide scale adoption is AR. I, I think it's already happened. I'm the fact that people still say, when is AI? I'm just, it's happening. Just look around. Snapchat, the filters are being used every day. Even with Facemoji back in 2018, these kids were changing their AR filters like three, four times a day to express themselves. AR has already happened, and we're just waiting for those glasses to really usher in sort of the, mixed, the new mixed reality realm, the metaverse realm. But AR, as it, as it stands, is already here. Snapchat's making big moves. Spark AR created their own blueprint style course for Facebook. This all feeds into the metaverse and it really just, it's just catalyzing that virtual clothing, the gaming that we're seeing. You should have a look at the Instagram filters that they have. It's unreal. The, 
and people are creating all the time. I'm in the Facebook's a dirty word, but I'm in the uh, I'm in the group for Spark AR <laughs> creators, and um, it's amazing the amount of the. This is what we should have had back in sort of 2018 is this level of creatorship and people coming in that are not so tech savvy but have this artistic background that can come in and actually take the technology and make something that is really appealing to the mainstream consumer. And so now we're seeing that and I'm really excited about that. Um, and I'm excited about VR as well. I think we're still just on the cusp. And if you haven't tried a quest, it's, I really recommend you do because that was ultimately what made me switch. When I first came to Vancouver, House of the VR fan put me in a headset and he said, you've just got to try this. And it was the Oculus Rift. So it was back, way back. And I loved it. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe people don't know about this. Everyone must know about this. I remember my first job at uh, 8VC when I turned 19 or 18 or something like that. And it was such a weird world because like I had gone from going to being in the hood in Chicago to then some snobby school at Claremont McKenna to then Morgan Stanley <laughs> to then like, and all this happened like a less than a year. Then to Joe Lonsdale's house, we had a real Game of Thrones chair in his backyard. So then coming to the office and seeing a big Oculus box. And back then they had all these cords and all this weird shit around it. I'm like, bro, see where that's evolved to now where you have basically incredibly lightweight, like mm -hmm. portable, actually pretty. <laughs> like they definitely had- It uh, is, right? And, uh, I actually think that we are like on the precipice of, of seeing wide adoption. One, one thing or one line that's gone through everything you've been talking about is timing. I'm curious, one, if you all have placed any bets in these spaces yet, and two, just generally as an investor, how you think about investing in timing and the why now and like getting ahead of something relative to pricing and things of, those na of that nature, because mm -hmm. effectively being an early stage investor, like everyone knows you have to figure out like who's the founder team mix mm -hmm. and an approach mix or vision mix that could get there. But like, how do you know? when you're investing in new categories, that it is the time to invest. Yeah, and that's, that's such an interesting question. We only and, got seven years to make returns, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think it's fair when people say, I'm willing to invest unless the demand is there. And I, I think that's fair, but it's not necessarily how I like to look at this stuff. I really came from like the little Michaela's, the virtual avatars, that, like the way VR, like, I was so inspired by these new forms of, of interaction. I really like to look for the, for the outliers and obviously Wave is doing insanely well right now. So that's a really good marker. But those that are on the cusp of being game changers. So maybe if the current market doesn't know it yet. So you can make, I have to look at it like this. You can make educated evaluations on a space, take video and TikTok, for example. Like there's so many new effects, green screen, like stuff that we weren't using at the start of when it became, so when it moved from Musical.ly to TikTok. And now these creators are becoming like fully fledged uh, media companies from their phone. And I think what we can say or, or see there is that naturally this might require some form of like special effects in the future. And I think like thinking like along that line, like those are the game changes so that everyone at some point will want to interact with Baby Yoda and TikToks and place him, all, him around the house. It's like a matter of time or a matter of finding that VFX technology that's optimized for mobile, something that isn't possible right now that we saw back with AR and how it was the depth sensing camera only came in on the iPhone 10. So those using iPhone sixes, it was just, you had to completely retrain the network. And so <laughs> I think what we're seeing is just, I'm trying to look for those sort of trends and behaviors, especially as the phone is now, it can do everything, right? And I think running a whole media business from the phone, thinking about all those assets that are currently lying around that aren't being used during the pandemic. I think there's so many different things that are happening that could all come together. And especially as video is definitely gonna be the next big thing, or it already is the thing. And it's just all about augmenting that content without needing just like full scale tech stack. You can just do it from your phone. I think that's the most exciting thing. So we actually did invest in a company uh, that's doing this, which is Beam, and you can find them on our site. But I'm really excited about this too. And they've been able, they've had all sorts of new technology successes. So I would really you, check You can't out. just drop that. You can't just drop that. And then not I can. Is it better what they do or is that all, is that something that you just can't talk about publicly? Or like wrap, wrap our section up so Clay could like speak? By the way, everyone, 
Can I can I drop it? He has COVID. Is that not cool? But uh, Clay, is, Clay is not in best condition, so we're giving him a break today. But if you can give us a quick blurb on what Bean does, because I think it's really cool. Yeah. Um, and then sure. we, we jump into the, the Spitfire. Sure. No, that's cool. What you would have normally seen in Adobe Aero, which is other AR tools, you can place an item in your environment and then it looks out of place. It doesn't have all the recognition of the environment. But what Beam does is you're able to take these assets, these digital assets that they have in the store, you're able to place them in the environment and then it actually is able to interact with the environment that's around. So you've seen this already with TikTok and the Lide AR integration. But what they're doing is truly magical because it's changing the whole of your background. You, you can include lots of different characters. You can interact with those characters in your videos and it can all be done from the mobile phone. So the founders are incredible. They're actually based uh, out of South Africa at the moment. We're obviously doing the immigration, but really interesting company and I think especially with some of the connections that they've currently got. So in the music space as well as in the movies, I think this is definitely the type of experience that people are going to want to lean towards in the future. And it's going to be very exciting, especially interacting with your favorite characters, building brand affinity and making those brands ultimately immune from displacement long-term, which is what we all need as everyone is battling for mindshare. That's why we invested in Beam. I'm really happy to, to talk more about it if anyone's interested. But yeah, really excited about this space. I think there's going to be lots of new tools coming out for creators, especially in 3D on the phone. So watch out for those. Okay, so I'm going to nerd out on this. I think there's a lot of possibilities there. But Clay, you there? You want to do the quick fire round? Yeah, we have five questions meant to be answered in two sentences or less. First one we have is what is a recommendation you hear regularly that you think is bad advice? Cool. So this is fake it till you make it, which is that famous Naomi Campbell expression. But for me, I think that assumes that when you get there, you're still faking it. So I say fake it till you become it. Ooh, it's brilliant. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> All right. Next one in the last year, what new belief, behavior, habit has most improved your life? Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Really? Yeah, 100%. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> that is a first. I feel like we've had a lot of like meditation, take a walk. <sighs> no, that's an original answer. I love it. Two more, best piece of advice for junior VCs or those aspiring to break into venture. Yeah, work at a startup before you break in. You'll be a much better analyst or associate if you can provide value post-investment because that's when the hard work starts. God, just giving gym after gym. All right, last one. Who is a mentor that you'd want to give credit to? Could be more than one. Yeah, I'm going to say Marco of the VR fund, Venture Reality Fund, who first introduced me to VR. And then I'm going to say Sarah and Maria at Unshackled for always answering my questions and just being the best support. Huge. Huge. Uh, so that wraps up the quick questions and the majority of the other questions that we have for you as promised we want to flip it around and allow you to ask any questions if you have any so it's a little bit evened out in terms of us peppering you with questions and at least want to allow the opportunity for uh, you to do the same got it so i want to know actually you could either uh, one of these i don't mind which one you answer but who has been your favorite podcast guest who or favorite dinner party guests uh, they can be dead or alive whichever one you like I, yeah i honestly like don't know the favorite guesses that's really tough so favorite what hypothetical dinner guest god who would be a lot of fun diego maradona oh really yes random. that just popped into my head but i feel like i love the party he could be a imagine the to, stories yes yeah it'd be great I'd great have one. to be probably a lot more fluent in Spanish to really enjoy that, but <laughs> yeah. I'd just have a translator or somebody to, to dumb it down for me. I love that. What about you? Oh, I would have Amy Winehouse for sure. Yeah, I want to know the truth. Honestly. I want to know everything about Blake. And then, yeah, I love your Maradona one. That's a great one. And then I'm just a sucker for the Gaga at the moment. So I think it would have to be 
Lady Gaga. <laughs> That's all my questions, guys. Thank you so much for having me and, and bringing me on. I, I really appreciate it. And I love what you guys do and just allowing us to chat about, about our experiences because this, this can be a little bit odd for those that didn't come from a finance background. So this is sick. And chat soon. Love it. Awesome. Huge thanks again to Faye for coming on this week. We hope that each of you were able to pick up something valuable from this talk. If you're looking to get in touch with Faye, we've linked her to her Twitter, bio, and other information about her below. We've also included the link to her newsletter, which we encourage each of you to go and subscribe for yourself. For next steps, if you're an investor and have not already signed up to join, we encourage you to check out our website at www.confluence.vc to submit your info to become a member. If you have any feedback for us, please feel free to reach out directly either to Tyler at tyler at gpv.com or myself at clay at Hope to hear from you all soon.